today we have the undisputed king of the television arts programme. He started here at the BBC, then left to create a new art show for ITV. Nearly 20 years later, he's still running and presenting the South Bank show, even though his greatest achievement must be surviving years of being pilloried on spitting image. His latest project looks at America's influence on the UK since the Second World War, and it starts next Sunday evening. And inside the spotted car, which was run by William Esme, father of my best friend, William Esme was the first jukebox in Wickton. We went in late at night, the first night it came, we played it as loudly as we possibly could. And we were looking, of course, for Elvis Presley, not fiddling on the radio for hours to find him, but he was here to play all the time. He was the detonator that plunged us into American youth, American music, American genes, American rebelliousness. Rather shamefully, he was a white boy singing black music, and we could identify with that. And he had the voice of the sorcerer, a voice that many of us have rather sadly tried to imitate ever since. Presley took us straight into the heart of America. Please welcome Melvin Bragg. I thought for a moment you were going to do an Elvis Presley impersonation of your own name. I'm afraid occasionally I do, yes. Do you? It's, it's a very, yeah, it's a rather... It is a bit of a sad fact about my generation. Uh, <laughs> Peter Cook used to do it all the time. And there's a certain stage at Christmas parties after midnight when you think you're among friends <laughs> and everybody can really sing Heartbreak Hotel. Is, is that the only impersonation you did? Uh, no, but I'm not doing any impersonation. <laughs> Why did I know you were I'm, going to do that? I'm, I'm having a <laughs> bit of a job impersonating myself at the moment. Tell me a bit more about Bragg in America. What else did you get up to? Well, the idea was just to look at... Uh, what's happened in the British view of America since the Second World War through my own eyes, autobiographically. I mean, the idea is that, in fact, we've been invaded by America. Um, I mean, I'm not anti-American. We'll keep seeing Americans. We trade with Americans. We're the biggest investor in America. We like things American. But there's a big takeover bit going on. I mean, in the Second World War, they described in their news bulletins that Britain, in Britain, had become an aircraft carrier for American planes, and that's how they saw it, and that's fine. And then the movies and the music and the fashions and the food and the McDonald's and the styles and the way of talking, things, we, were, we have actually, a lot of us have enjoyed a lot of it, mm. enjoyed being colonized by America, and they've colonized the imagination of a lot of young people, and people enjoyed it up to a point, but now I think, uh, particularly with what's happened in the last uh, 10 years in this country and in America, I think it's time to say, look, Fair enough, fine. America's wonderful about living in the present. Uh, and we've taken that, and we've actually learned a lot from that. But a lot of their ideas we uh, don't want. I mean, Britain has got different traditions. It's got longer traditions. It's got, can draw on its own strengths. And I, the program ends quite affectionately, saying that it's about time we declared our own declaration of independence against America. Okay, you were quoted as saying you thought at one time we were becoming infatuated with America. Do you still believe that? Yeah. I think we are, my generation was. I started off being infatuated with America. I mean, after the Second World War, I was born in 1939. After the Second World War, America was, I mean, the biggest influence in my life, my family and the church and so on. But after that, it was the movies and the colour and the cowboys. You imitated cowboys going down the street. You, you imitated, imitated cowboys yeah, of course going down the street. Yeah. You're a little boy. You're, you're, you're holding. Oh, I can just see it. <laughs> and you banged your behind with a sort of imaginary <laughs> stick. And you're in Wigton. Yeah, of course. Yeah, in Wigton. <laughs> The whole town was doing it. We were seething with cowboys. In fact, the place was full of horses at the time anyway, so you didn't notice much difference. And then you imitated the gangster films, Edward G. Robinson, and uh, the musicals. You thought everybody should sing and dance on every occasion. It was a, it was a huge influence on us at the time. It really was. And we, were, we welcomed it because it was colour and it was life and it was ordinary people. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of British oppressive society, ration books and class systems. It was mm. your ordinary Joe and Joe S in America getting on with it. Hard to imagine Melvin in jeans. Well, I, my you first ma pair of jeans was made for me by my Auntie Ada. And <laughs> made out of uh, black material, the sort of material they used to, was left over from the Second World War where you had blinds to keep, to, stop, to stop the Luftwaffe bombing Wigton in the north. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you cut that out and there's a pair have of you, black jeans. You haven't jeans. still got them, have you? I haven't still got them, no, no. You haven't? No, I haven't. <laughs> you said you'd, you'd done this programme in an autobiographical, biography type of way, but that's quite unusual for you, isn't it? You don't normally do it that way. No, I, I find it quite difficult. Usually I do, uh, I do uh, what you're <laughs> doing inside a, a film. I, 
I'm part of, I'm an editor of the show, but my job as an interviewer is to talk to these painters and writers and make a do help to make a mm. documentary. So I found it quite difficult to just turn to the camera and say, this is what I think well, I about think that, and I found that tricky. 20 years on the South Bank Shore, so 20 or so years. Sounds man like and boy, salt mines. <laughs> <laughs> editor and presenter. <laughs> Why do you think it's lasted the test of time so well? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think we've been lucky. Oh, you're being modest now, yeah, come on. I think we have been lucky, actually. We've been lucky, the people who've backed us inside the system. I also think in the last 20 years, a lot of people in this country uh, are, are more and more interested in a wide range of the arts. I don't think we. I think if ever we were a philistine country, which I doubt, we're certainly not now. Mm. All over the place, galleries are full. People go to movies. People like all sorts of music and so on. I think one of the things that might have helped was that we cover a wide range. That is to say, um, we're doing something on the Bee Gees coming up. We're also doing something on the great Russian conductors, 43-year-old Gagarin, who's probably the most dynamic conductor in the world. We did something on Victoria Wood, and we also did something on Howard Hodgkin, the painter. So we, we cover a wide range, so people can come in and out. The audience figures must change yes, dramatically they, they, when you no, do... No, not dramatically, but they change a bit, yeah. Because you did it at Coronation Street. <laughs> yeah, that was the b biggest audience uh, for the last two or three mm. years, yes. Did you enjoy doing something like that as opposed to something perhaps a little more obscure? Well, I enjoy both, to be honest. Uh, uh, Coronation Street was particularly enjoyable because... Are you a fan? Yeah, I'm interested in it. Yeah, and, and the, the soaps, they're well written in this country and they carry so many people with them. And you, you've got that good drama, well acted, um, and millions and millions of people are watching and involved in it. Something serious is going on. It's also very enjoyable. So to find out how it's made, who makes it, what they're trying to do, I think that's part of our culture, just as much a part as a great painter, a contemporary painter like David Hockney and so on. A lot of people do think, though, that the arts are quite highbrow and fairly inaccessible. Would you like to see that changed? I think it, I honestly think it is changing, Carol. I really think it's changing very, very quickly, especially the, the, when people get a chance. I think people resented certain arts, as I did when I was a kid. I, you know, it was curious. I'd be listening to the radio. I went to piano lessons, and I'd be playing, like you do at piano lessons, classical music, because that's mm. what... And I'd hear it on the radio, and I'd turn it off because it wasn't for me. I wanted to listen to popular, but I didn't really really, in the choirs in church in the town, I was singing Handel and so on. When he came on the radio, you turned, you thought it wasn't for you. Now I think that what's happened in the last mm, 30, 40 years with more and more people getting more and more educated and radio and television has played a huge part in this, is that people say, it's okay for us. We can enjoy Pavarotti. We can go to galleries, we can listen to this stuff. I think people have become much more open to it, and they are always capable of understanding it. It's not particularly mm. difficult. And I think people are welcoming it more and more. I actually think one of the things that's, that, that's, that, that's marked our country over the last 50 years has been more and more people interested in what's generally called the arts, and a recognition that you can be an artist in different areas. Paul McCartney is a wonderful songwriter, you know? Uh, so was Puccini. Uh, who's to say in 150 style. years' time who's going who's gonna to end up top of the heap? You never quite know. What do you like to work for? Well, you should ask somebody else about that. I think, <laughs> I've I read think, plenty of I think I'm absolutely said. terrific to work. <laughs> <laughs> now then, you, you tell me what everybody else says. Well, tell me, there was a, a producer was quoted as saying he'd known you 10 years or so, but still didn't feel he really, really knew you particularly well, that you were a hard man to get to know, that you could be quite tempestuous. Would you agree with that? Yeah, both those things. I, I don't think, I, well, I think I'm hard to get to know. That's difficult to say, but I've got a few friends and they'll do. <laughs> I don't, and I don't trust people who say I've got hundreds of friends. Mm. How can you have hundreds of friends? I mean, you just have a few friends. And uh, I like working relationships with people. I think they're very open and easy, but, you know, you can't be a friend with everybody. There isn't time, and then you, you don't want to be emotionally involved with everybody. So that's, I suppose, a bit true. I also, I mean, if you're lucky enough, as we are, to work in a job you like, and my parents' generation didn't have that privilege. I mean, they made the best of jobs they worked in, but they, mm. none of them had a job they wanted to do. If you're lucky to have a job you like, which I have and you have, I mean, the people you work with are just a pleasure to work with. You're working with interesting people, do you? And it's re I mean, people are turning off, uh, saying in their droves, what a self-satisfied smug chap he is. But it's, <laughs> it, it's got to be said, because people pretend that our job is hard. It's hard in certain ways. But we have the great privilege of doing what we want to do and working with people. Like, therefore, working is a pleasure in itself. 
But you've got to keep your distances in work. In mm. the end, somebody's got to make a decision. Somebody's got to take the responsibility. In my outfit, it's me. So you've got to take a step back. You can't do anything else. It was rumoured a few years ago, had Neil Kinnock come into power, that there was a job for you as Minister of the Arts. Would you have taken it, had it been offered? Well, you never know what you'll do when things are offered. You have to wait and see. <laughs> Politics <laughs> is not for you, though, you don't think? Well, I, I wouldn't stand for Parliament because uh, there are too many people who are better qualified and they've devoted their lives to it and I, that's let them get on with it. There are jobs that are outside Parliament that are quite interesting and, and if one's offered, you wait to see. Maybe yes, maybe no. I, genuinely, you don't know until you're offered it. It must also amuse you that the interest that gathers in you personally, though, you, your impressions that people do of you, your nasal-sounding voice, does that make you laugh or do you just brush it aside and think, keep going? Well, I thought the spitting image thing was terrific. <laughs> it's it a sincere very... form of flattery, surely. Well, it was, they used to, printing image used to go on the air just before we came on the air. And mm. in the early days, they often sounded off by uh, having my puppet there. And then they would do a, quite a good uh, imitation. They would say, uh, Adele, this has big show. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not forget to turn off your sets. <laughs> Well, we'll look forward to seeing Bragg in America this coming Sunday. Ladies and gentlemen, Melvin Bragg. <laughs> Tomorrow it's Safety in Numbers when I'll be joined by a fellow Scot who is also an outstandingly talented musician. That's Evelyn Glennie. See you then. Bye-bye.